All right, Roger Nishioka. Roger Nishioka uh, comes to us today with, a, with kind of a brief. He could have spoken on theology because he has an extraordinarily theological mind and has written and thought a great deal about that. Or he could have talked about the sociology, but the portfolio we asked him to pick up was practices, right? Best practices, the experiences, what have we learned about youth ministry and how could we do better than Roger Nishioka, who has time in grade as a youth minister growing up in congregational and Presbyterian churches, 14 years as the national director of ministries, adolescents, and youth for the PCUSA, uh, and has been teaching on this subject in five different courses at Columbia Theological Seminary uh, in Decatur, Georgia. Just to whet your appetite and set you up for what he must be accountable to answer questions on since he wrote books about it. Uh, he has, he has, uh, he has, it's my job to elevate the expectations so high that they Oh, gosh. <laughs> Roger is working. Sit down, Skip. Roger, oh, I see our time is up. Yeah. Roger is working on at church question mark. Ministry with Young People, and he is revising a very well-received book, uh, Roots of Who We Are, and has published Sowing the Seeds and Exploration of Faith Development in Adolescence. So there's much, much fruit that he has to bring us, and a generosity of spirit to come up and join us. So, Roger, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't, ha I didn't have to that. These are party favors from Roger. I'm going to pass this ball around. If you did not get your party favor, would you take it as we pass it around? There we go. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Hey, friends, Lord be with you. And also with you. Okay, so I know, yeah, human flourishing. Thank you, um, Dr. Wolf. Um, so I know that um, um, I'm going to use the screen, and uh, I was reminded by Greta, I know there are some sight line issues. And if you can't hear me at a certain point, uh, then you need to signal to me as well. But um, I'm going to use the screen at least to an extent for our conversation. Um, so, ministry with young people, conversation with youth ministry leaders. Um, uh, Skip said this. I really am, I've been charged with looking at uh, practical application for youth ministry. I teach in the practical theology area at Columbia Seminary. It's entirely possible to be practical and theological at the same time. So um, within that, I'm a, a professor of Christian education. My specialization is youth and young adult ministry. Uh, we are blessed at Columbia to have two full-time professors in Christian education. My colleague, Kathy Dawson, who is amazing, teaches me things every day. Um, her specialization is early childhood and children. I pick up youth and young adults, and then together we cover the adult spectrum in Christian education. And the practical theology area is all kinds of fields, like the doing of ministry, preaching, pastoral care, worship, uh, pastoral theology, et cetera, evangelism, church growth. Yeah, <laughs> a Presbyterian school has an evangelism professor, kind of a illusion. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> and he came to us from the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. <laughs> yeah, because we couldn't find a Presbyterian who knows about evangelism. So. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. I'm tremendously honored. Um, gift, uh, gift for 2012. Gift for 2012. People trust you with a precious commodity. What is it? Their children. Uh, children, and more importantly, right now, their souls. Time. Time. 2012. The precious commodity is time. Certainly, it's children. You're exactly right. Thank you for saying that, and for young people. But precious commodity, even for our young people, is their time. Right. Okay, more precious than gold, and given, even given uh, the world markets, more precious than Facebook stock, which will soon make Mark Zuckerberg the most wealthiest person in the history of humankind, etc., um, is people's time. So if folk gift you with their time, your job is to? Nice, nice. Treat it with respect and integrity and uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit as it is. So I'm grateful for your time. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm amazed with Skip also. Uh, I was thinking, oh, nice lunch, 15, 16 people on a table, have a nice conversation. And then uh, I wrote to Greta and said, what are we talking about? And she said, oh, about 100 people will show up. And I thought, really? <laughs> These people need to get a life. Um, <laughs> but I am honored that you're here, especially to talk about young people, which is my passion and my love. Um, so let's pray together, please. So we give you thanks, O oh God, for the gift that you give to us, not only your time, but also your body through your Son, Jesus Christ, with whom we are journeying yet once again to Jerusalem in these days. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your gift of your Holy Spirit who sustains us 
even in the moments when we do not know or acknowledge or recognize that your spirit is moving for us and through us, sometimes perhaps in spite of us, yet your spirit moves and she blows through our lives and sustains us all, indeed your whole creation. And we thank you for you, O oh God, mother and father of us all, who made us in your own image, even the image of an early adolescent middle schooler, <laughs> even the image of a junior in high school, even the image of a young adult, even the image of an old one and a newborn. So we give you thanks, O oh God, for the ways you image around us, your being, indeed your whole creation. Help us to be so attentive to you that we see you in every place in which we are venturing in these days. And God's people say, amen. 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 So uh, my conversation is, it really is a conversation with uh, youth ministry leaders. You're doing this beautifully already. Uh, my own tradition, you can tell, uh, perhaps you can't, but you can, uh, I'll tell you right now, is an Asian-American tradition. I come from a Japanese-American tradition, uh, born and raised in Honolulu. And like the president, I have a birth certificate, and it's real. Anyway, um, I live in the state of Georgia, so that's an issue. So um, uh, um, in my own tradition, I realize that um, I am a permission-seeking person. It's what I've been raised with as an Asian-American. Those of you who are Asian-Americans in this room, you are in that same stream. You know this, that you don't participate until you've been invited into the conversation. So I'm inviting you into the conversation, OK? Um, uh, I grew up in Honolulu and then uh, was called to Seattle uh, where I was uh, living for a while with my folks, went to undergraduate, high school, etc. Went to seminary in Chicago, uh, uh, graduate school, PhD work there as well, and then now I'm teaching in a place called Decatur, Georgia, Atlanta, which is a great place to be um, at Columbia Seminary. Uh, what I've discovered is not all cultures are permission-seeking cultures, but I'm trying to issue permission at this point for the conversation. Um, I'm uh, preaching in uh, one of our African-American, historic African-American congregations outside of Atlanta. I discovered that, uh, uh, by and large, the African-American culture in worship doesn't expect permission. Uh, it's granted already. So when I was in McCormick Seminary, I was uh, taking preaching class, and uh, one of my professors talked about how a great tool in preaching is the rhetorical question. <laughs> What's a rhetorical question? <laughs> ah, nicely done. Dr. Richards says, a question that you ask expecting no answer. And this uh, comes from an Anglo, older, white Presbyterian <laughs> professor. He says, these are effective tools in preaching these days. <laughs> I was in a historic African-American congregation outside of Atlanta. I had a great rhetorical question. So what is the word of God for us today? Thinking, dang, that is a great rhetorical question. <laughs> I misread my context. I wasn't in a white church. I wasn't in an Asian-American congregation. I was in a historic black church. Woman in the back, lovely hat, <laughs> blurted out, well, honey, if you don't know, then why are you up there? <laughs> and I wish I could say that I responded really nicely. Um, but I'll tell you, I was shocked. I was like, uh, uh, well, I, I know. Uh, I'm, I'm preaching, I've got a sermon, but, uh, oh, that, that was rhetorical. You, you, you shouldn't answer. And she said, well, baby, in this church, if you don't want no answers, don't ask no questions. And I said, oh, yeah, no, no more questions. Bad asking questions. So I'm inviting a conversation this day, really, truly. Okay, so a conversation is being invited, permission is being given for those of you who need that uh, from your particular context, your particular culture. Those of you who do not, thanks be to God for you. Okay, so I hope to have a conversation about you, about just the nature of ministry, um, line out some things with you, um, and then we'll see where we go. So you have one of these, right? Okay, practice of youth ministry. Okay, 
if you would please take it out. Um, because of the space, I realize that this is difficult for us. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, uh, stand up please if you would. Um, you, you probably can't move very well, but your goal is to find somebody around you. Uh, choose, you agree on a number. Numbers one through uh, on the very back is 20. Thank you. Well done, Bruce. Numbers one through 20, you agree on a number and you answer it together. Please go to that number, whatever it is, just choose one and then do that with a couple other people around you as much as you possibly can. Ready? Go. I would say the second thing is um, my, I've got aging parents, and I, I'm one of four boys, which is nice, but I live in Atlanta. Okay, sit down, sit down. Finish the conversation, sit down. Sit down, finish the conversation. Hey, thank you for that. So um, uh, in the practice of youth ministry, um, that's called something called group building, right? Okay. I teach a class at Columbia Seminary um, titled, I'm trying to stay out, guy, make, make eyes at me if I'm too much on the screen. Um, I teach a class on uh, group building and faith formation at Columbia Seminary. Um, everybody's picking up on this. Corporations are picking up on this, that the whole idea of groupness and group building is essential. Even corporations are realizing for workers to get together and function in the same way. Okay? The Church of Jesus Christ is no different. Amen? Amen. And young people are no different, especially. I want to argue that young people are especially in need in these days of group building as well. So um, there is bad group building. There are bad resources out there that are stupid. Okay? <laughs> and some of you are buying them, so stop it. Okay? Um, but I want to talk about what good group building then is. In good group building, I think every person's included. All right. So in this activity, who is included? Everyone. Everyone. Um, even you who are introverts, whom the Lord made also. You were included. <laughs> okay. Um, extroverts, you get your energy from other people. Introverts, you get your energy from from within yourselves. That's not a bad thing. What? A <laughs> comment is energy from Diet Coke. Thank you very much. Um, energy comes from within inside yourself. Can introverts exhibit great extrovert skills? Yes. yes, they can. Just after a while, they have to go into a closet and go, <laughs> okay? Literally, okay? One of my best friends, you would never know she's an extrovert, but after a Sunday morning, she goes home. And she sleeps, okay, and is just gone, etc. all right? And I'll say, hey, let's go see movies. He goes, no, no, I'm going home. I have to go home, all right? In good group building, every person's included. There are awful, awful group building activities in books that they're selling to you and to me, Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists. We love to buy these books. UCC folks, you buy all these books, etc. that tell young people that you are out, you, you play a group activity, and if you don't do it right, you're out. That doesn't qualify, okay? Because t you tell me a 13-year-old boy gets out, then he gets bored, then he gets destructive. <laughs> That's not his fault. That's the nature of creation, okay? <laughs> then you yell at him because he broke something, okay? I want to argue that's whose fault. It's your fault because you constructed it that way, okay? I don't mind elimination activities. I just want every opportunity for the kid to get back in, all right? Because there are elimination things where you get out and then you have to get tagged to get back in. I love that, okay? So no one stays out all the time. In good group building, every person's included. Number two, the leader models and participates. I was just with a group of 200 high schoolers in Northeast Georgia uh, this past weekend speaking to them. And pretty much during all of the group building activities, where were my adults? They were on the edge, tell me again. They were talking to each other on the edge of the room, drinking coffee, and it was bad coffee, so there's no excuse, okay? <laughs> and I hate that, all right? Because you have a chance to model and participate. Do you have to be able to do what you're asking them to do? You, no, nicely done. 
So one of my best experiences of a youth ministry leader was a paraplegic who's 63 years old. Her name is Shirley, and she led us in recreation up, uh, upstate, uh, out of, outside of Milwaukee at a conference center. I remember it was wet that spring. We had to take all of these 8 by 10 huge plywood sheets and lie them end to end at the end of the field so that Shirley could roll up and down with her megaphone and give us instructions. Okay? <laughs> could she do what she was asking us to do? No. But if there was a miraculous healing, which is entirely possible by the grace of God, amen? Amen. If I asked any kid on that field, 400 kids on that field, all Presbyterian kids, if I said to them, do you think if there was a miraculous healing that surely in a moment would be out of her wheelchair and on this field, every single kid would have said what? Yes. Yes. In a moment, she'd be out. Okay? So you model and you participate. Um, third idea is that in good group building, each person's right to pass is preserved. Did I give you the right to pass? No. no. I did not. Okay? So you have to decide if you're going to give young people the right to pass. Because if you give it, guess what? They'll take it. And you'll say, no, it's what's the last 12 minutes. Okay? And everyone just passed. And then you say, oh, come on, you guys, just do it. Okay? And then they're like, okay, cool. We were just testing to see if you were worth your word. Do you have, a, do you have any integrity about you at all? Oh, good, you don't. <laughs> so you go into this whole category of other adults in our lives who have no integrity about them. You, you say to us, don't do as I do, do as I say. Well, thank you. That's an operative philosophy of life, and we understand that. And so now we put you over in that category, okay? If you give the right to pass to adolescents, be ready, because they may take it. And then what do you do? Live with it. Nicely done. You, then you go on to the next thing and say, okay, well, let's try this, okay? Um, I didn't give you the right to pass. So that you, were making the, uh, you make the decision. You choose as a group leader whether you give them the right to pass. Um, I'm hunching that pretty much uh, in these 20 questions, there are some harder ones than there are some easy. Elizabeth and I did a harder one. Elizabeth and I did um, sources of anxiety for the future. Num what number was that? Do you remember? I can't remember. Three? There are some harder ones than easier ones. What, what a kid could do with a booklet like this is the kid could decide what? Yeah, I don't want to do that one and go to a safer one, et cetera. So that is a built in to an extent. But I think the right to pass is important. You decide if you can give it or not. To be honest, when I work with middle schoolers, I often don't give them the right to pass because my middle schoolers, um, Chances are, may not know, um, one of my best uh, friends in ministry, uh, amazing, amazing pastor, um, she, uh, Mrs. Williams, uh, Reverend Williams, she says to her sixth graders, um, they say, Mrs. Williams, we don't want to do this. She goes, baby, you don't know what you want. <laughs> I'll tell you what you want. You want to follow Jesus, that's what you want. <laughs> like, okay. So she doesn't entertain, she says, baby, you're in sixth grade, you don't know what you want. You don't know what you want. You want to follow Jesus, that's what you want. Okay. And then they do whatever she tells them to do, okay? So sometimes, my early adolescents, I don't give them the right to pass, because I know they don't know what they want. They just don't know, okay? Please. Is there a way to uh, give them the right, but also encourage them not to take the right? Oh, nicely done. Um, it's a great question, tell me your name. Bruce asks, is there a way to give them the right but encourage them not to take the right? The answer is yes. What's the way? There are several ways. Well, what's one way? <laughs> okay, we're still, we're still sort of in the Diet Coke trajectory there, yeah. Um, the answer is candy, yes. You can bribe them, that's true. I want to argue when leaders model and participate, they, want to, they, want, they, they don't want to pass. Because part of it is they want to see what you do. Okay? If leaders truly model and participate and they realize, oh, I'll be darned. So you're going to actually be doing this with us. Then often, because you've modeled it, they won't pass. Because they'll say, this could be fun. And besides, we get to watch Bruce do it. Okay? And be entertained. And it'll be up on Facebook in a few moments. Okay? <laughs> So, it's a great question, yes. 
there are ways, and I, I think the most critical thing in group building theory is what the leadership does. If everyone's in it, then people tend not to pass because safety issues and trust issues rise. They feel like, okay, if I'm going to be embarrassed, guess what? We're all going to be embarrassed, and you're going to be most embarrassed because you look stupid, Pastor, <laughs> doing this. Okay? Thank you for asking. Uh, the group is built at no one person's expense. There are actually resources out there that say what you do is you pick on one kid, everyone laughs at that kid, and the group building happens. Isn't that lovely? Theologically, you tell me when in the kingdom of God, when in the reigndom of God, did Jesus decide the way that's best to build the whole body of Christ is to pick on one person and make them ostracized. It doesn't hold theologically. Okay, so the group builds is built at no one person's expense. My last one, this is my catch-all. Um, the group building honors the presence of the Holy Spirit. My catch-all on this is um, that's why I don't do food games, which makes me sad because I love food games. Uh, I love playing with food. I love having young people play with food. I think it's hilarious. What is my problem with playing with food? It gets messy, thank you, that's true. What else? It is disrespectful of? Uh, of our resources. And not everyone, thank you, say, say it again. Amen, not everyone has food to eat. And the, the, what happened to me was I was at a conference center in Virginia, and we had this thing called the banana relay, okay? And so we were invited up into teams, and the, the, the banana is the baton. And you go through all these different activities, and the b banana gets passed from activity to activity. At the very end, in order to win, okay, the leader has to eat the, eat the banana. By the end of the activity, the banana what? <laughs> Is horrible, okay? <laughs> and everyone's cheering and eating, and the bananas are brown and mushy, and people are spitting it out and throwing it away, et cetera, and, and, and God is totally messing with me. It's just a handful of, it's like, you know, we only had like 15, 16 teams. So just 15, 16 bananas, this is, this is not hard, you know, this, come on. There was an um, exchange student apparently right there next to me from Costa Rica. Dang, stupid God. Okay. <laughs> and she's clapping, all right, and she says, this is so much fun. I love watching Americans play with the food from my country. Oh. And I'm like, it's just 16 bananas. What? I, I'll give you money. What? Why, why is this so? Oh, I love this. This is so great. America is such a great country. I'm like, please, come on. It's just 16 bananas. It's OK. OK? Message to her was? That which is a staple of your country, we get to play with. Americans can disrespect this. And there are people who are hungry around us. 25% of children in the United States today will go hungry, let alone the entire world, okay? This is my catch-all for all resources, not wasting resources. So if you don't want to take these little booklets, which one of my students, bless her heart, stapled and cut out, okay? Give it back to me and she'll be glad, okay? Um, but if you want to take them home, that's fine. But all have resources, okay? In um, group building theory, Here's the idea. Um, in group building theory, groupness is achieved through a minimum of 17 contact hours. They've quantified it. They say it takes 17 hours minimally for a group to be a group. Your job is to build groupness among the adolescents, the young people in your congregation, in your parish. That's your job, okay? Group building theory says you don't get groupness until you've had 17 hours, 17 contact hours, all right? Here's the theory. The 17 contact hours, they don't have to be contiguous, but they do have to be continuous, okay? So it isn't 17 hours all attached. It could be, but it doesn't have to be, but it does have to be 17 continuous hours, which means that every time the group meets, five of you or 15 of you or whatever it is, whenever the group meets, the same people have to be there. Otherwise, you go back to hour number one. Okay, so you get a parent of a lovely sophomore who says to you, you know, I would like Jennifer to go, but she keeps on saying she doesn't have any friends in the youth group or at church. 
And you're like, well, that's odd, because Jennifer knows all these other young people, and she does. What Jennifer is saying to her mom and to you vicariously is, I don't have groupness. I don't have groupness, okay? This is the shift, and this is God's intention. This is how you know God has a great sense of humor. At about uh, 11, 12 years old, um, God says to young people, begin to shift your primary allegiance from whom? Parents. Parents to whom? Peers. To peers. At the same time, this is how you know God has a great sense of humor. God says to parents, this is a really scary time. Hold on. Okay? <laughs> So you have adolescents saying, get away, get away, and parents are like, come back, come back, and God's going, this is so cool. <laughs> okay? So when you go to heaven, you can say, what was up with that, Lord? But for the time being, that's the intention. The reason why it's the intention is because when they're 33, they ought not to be having their primary relationship with you. Some of us know 33-year-olds who are still attached to their mothers and fathers, and it's not attractive. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't happen very well on eHarmony.com. It's not a good thing. Okay? Who are your best friends? My mom and my dad, best friends in my life, etc. Okay? So there's a whole shift going on. They're supposed to be more aligned to their peers than they are to their parents at this point. That's God's intention. So you're trying to build 17 contact hours for groupness. Groupness is defined as three ways. Groupness means persons claim common rituals and norms, that there is a way of doing, a way of being that is common. I can ask anybody in the group, what are some rituals, what are some norms, ways of behaving, ways of living together, and every person says the same kinds of things, not in the same language, but they get ideas of rituals and norms. A ritual, keep in mind, is any activity that opens us to deeper meaning. A ritual is any activity that opens us to deeper meaning. Not all activities are rituals or ritualistic, all right? So rituals and norms. Um, second major qualification for groupness, persons share a common story and purpose. I can ask anybody in the group, um, what's the reason for your existence? And there'll be similar language, not identical, but similar language. People will say, this is why we're doing this, this is what we're about, etc. Um, the common story, there's a narrative that floats around that young people share after a point of groupness. Corporations have picked up on this. That's why corporations pay tons of money to send teams of workers to go out to these conference centers and do group building activities. Exact same kinds of things you and I are doing in youth ministry, only they pay $27,000 a weekend to do this. Okay? <laughs> Because they realize when those people together have this common rituals and norms and share a common story and purpose, they function better, they work more effectively, and they are more productive for the corporation. We are no different, all right? Um, I'm arguing that adolescence in these 17 hours, it's interesting, the research is actually pushing the hours up. 10 years ago, it was 14. 2012, it's now 17 hours. Why is it getting higher? Uh, nicely done. Electronic distractions. Uh, social technology stuff is huge. That's true. Distractions in general. Well done. Other reasons why it's getting higher? Uh, Elizabeth says we don't know how to do community. You're ex I'm sorry, Christine says uh, we don't do community. And we do You're exactly right. We're the loss of community in America. Robert Putnam and others, etc. Please. Uh, members of various groups. So we, we sort of dip in various groups and never nest or land in one. Nicely done. Other, other reasons? Other games are in town. Other, are in town. other options available to us? Well done. Choices have, have exploded exponentially. Other major issue? There is a healthy dose of skepticism and cynicism among adolescents <laughs> about any group. Why? Why are they more skeptical and cynical before they invest in a group in these days? Every group wants something from them. Ah, nice. That's a great uh, statement. Every group seems to want something from them. That's true. Ah, individualism. That's nice. Uh, the rise of this, it's all about me, which fits lovely in some level with egocentrism, which is where adolescents are. So it's all about me, exactly. In institutions. Authority, uh, authority, institutions. 
Nice, nice, that's beautifully well said. A lack of trust in institutions, authority, etc. In a 24-7 news cycle, we know, th we know more things now about people that we never wanted to know, okay? And so they're saying um, that they don't trust necessarily any group because they've watched people betray trust over and over and over again. Whether it's a priest, whether it's a athlete, or a politician, or a school teacher, or whomever. We watch people betray trust over and over again. This skepticism, this mistrust, this cynicism is throughout the entire culture, the entire society. So it's taking longer to get to groupness. Um, and the group exhibits the ability to maintain its identity in the midst of a dialectical, uh, sorry, dialectical challenges, sorry. Um, oh, I should have done that better. Languages, eh, dialectical challenges. So the great dialectic, okay, what's the great dialectic? Come on, my philosophers, Hegelian dialectic, what? Starts with, uh, and, uh, nicely, ends up there. Thesis, and leads to, nicely done. That's the dialectic, okay? A thesis, an opposing idea, leads to a new creation, a new way of thinking, a new way of being. That's a dialectic, okay? Um, one of my uh, faculty members, um, honorably retired, Walter Brueggemann, who wrote most of the Old Testament, because um, uh, he, he was around then. Anyway, um, uh, Walter says the great dialectic, he pulls from a philosopher named Paul Ricoeur, he says the great dialectic throughout all of Scripture, Old Testament, and he argues New Testament, um, is a new te um, uh, orientation, God's people, an orientation next to uh, well, yeah, thank you, Professor. Disorientation leading to reorientation. Walter says that's the whole story of the Bible. People are in orientation. Cool, I get this. Then they're disoriented. That golden calf thing didn't work out very well. Odd, okay? <laughs> and then having to reorient, okay? Walter says that's the dialectic. Here's the challenge. In this 21st century, when you get to that antithesis, that disorientation, most people will what? Leave, exactly. They will opt out, because this isn't fun anymore, and this isn't meeting my needs, and it's all about me, okay? Um, I was talking about this with one of my pastoral care uh, theology professor colleagues, Dr. Pamela Cooper-White, who is a great Episcopalian. Okay, fine, you people. <laughs> <sighs> great Episcopalian priest. Anyway, Cooper White was talking to me and she was saying, you know, Roger, what's amazing thing about uh, marriage and family therapy, when you have a couple or a family that's in major disorientation, if you can get them to reorientation, that family, that marriage on the other side of it is, stronger. is stronger. It is more resilient. Is the pain there? Yeah. Heck yeah. Is the memory there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were like, man, you were stupid. Yeah, I was stupid, okay? But she said, on the other side of it, when you get that family or that couple to the other side of disorientation to reorientation, they are like, I'll be darned. We are stronger than I ever imagined. That was bad. But look how we survived that. That's the essence of resilience. There's a ton of money right now being thrown in uh, studies about young people and resilience factors, it's called the resilience factor, because they're trying to figure out what makes a kid be resilient, can we quantify resilience in some way? And this ability to stand through disorientation, antithesis to the other side, that's an amazing, amazing place to be, okay? I would add, as theologians, you and I, by the grace of God, we end up on the other side of disorientation to reorientation in our relationship with each other, with God, even possibly with the church of Jesus Christ, is stronger. Pain is still there, memory is still there, but this ability to survive a dialectical challenge is quite remarkable. So, 17 hours, um, not necessarily contiguous, but continuous. So I've got a youth group, and we're gathering for an hour and a half once a week. We start in mid-August. When is it possible for me to get to 17 hours? <laughs> if everyone shows up every single time, earliest possible? November. November. The problem is, you already see it coming. What happens? People show up, not show up. Some of our adult leaders rotate and change. Okay? 
I totally get this. I totally get that you're trying to recruit leaders and you're like, you don't have to come every time. <laughs> I know you're busy. You're traveling. So just come when you can. Okay? The problem is, every single time that group meets, they're on our number one. one. Okay? In group building theory, our one, 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 that gets really, really old fast. People get weary of our one. There is no ritual and norm. There's no shared history or purpose. There's no sense of being able to survive in the midst of a dialectical challenge. Why should I invest in this group? Why should I be a part of this? This applies, I'm convinced, to church boards and sessions and consistories and committees. I'm convinced that this is lived out in every single time we try to be a group, okay? So tell me how you get in youth ministry to 17 hours as fast as possible. Ah, uh, nice, a lock-in, literally, a lock-in, okay? But you're doing a lock-in, and uh, this lovely parent comes to you and says, oh, um, I know this is really important, but hey, Sean has a soccer game tomorrow morning. I can, I can pick him up at 6.30, drop him off later at 1 o'clock after he plays a soccer game and cleans up. That'll be okay, right? And you say to her, to the well-meaning mom, oh, it's not going to be okay. Please. Oh, ooh. And they will celebrate their return and, and just enjoy them, but they'll be mindful of their absence throughout their absence. Oh, wow, lovely language. <laughs> ooh, golly, also guilt-ridden, which as an Asian American, I <laughs> love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, yeah. often, often the yeah. What? Say, what? Often the parents say, well, you know what, I'll find another way. Yeah, yeah, nicely done. I totally get that. <laughs> Is there former Roman Catholics? Even better. That's great stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Um, my parents growing up knew that they could, they could, they could hit us, but they wouldn't because they're bad parents. They would spank us, but they wouldn't because they're bad parents. They would do the evil, evil thing. They would use the D word. The D word is, we're so... Oh, I hated that. I was like, please, just beat me, okay? They're like, no, Roger, that's okay. We're just disappointed in you. I'm like, okay, can I just die right now, please, etc. No, I think you're exactly right. Please. Oh, that's lovely. If you miss a practice, you're benched. If you miss a rehearsal, you don't yep. perform. That's it. Tell me your name. Peter. Peter asked a great, did you hear the question? Peter asked, how do you balance this requirement, if you will, with, a, with being a community full of grace, whereas in the other parts of their lives, if they miss a practice, if they miss a rehearsal, they can't perform, they can't do the recital, they can't play, et cetera. But how about we be, we be a grace-filled community? I, Peter, thank you. I completely support that and agree with you. I want to be a grace-filled community. What I do say to my parents is, on this weekend, we're trying, I tell them this theory, this is not secret, okay? I tell my youth group this theory at Central Presbyterian Church Atlanta, okay? Um, we're trying for 17 contact hours. So I really appreciate, and everything else that we do, show up or don't show up. But for this fall retreat, we're trying to build groupness. I need 17 hours, okay? And when I tell the parent that, step parent that, then she realizes I don't hate her, I don't hate her kid. <laughs> I've got actually a theological and pedagogical framework for this, okay? We're trying to get 17 hours. It's gotten to the point, a little bit spooky, where I've got my kids coming to me and saying, hey, what hour are we on? <laughs> and I'll say, I think we're on hour 11. And they're like, it feels like hour 11. <laughs> because we're still in our little individual groups, okay? Because I've got... 22 young people on a good night, really, truly, and I've got 17 high schools in that 22 young people, et cetera. And so they feel like, yeah, we're, it feels like an hour 11 because we're still not doing this groupness stuff you talked about. I mean, my young people know this, and they articulate it. I've had young people say to their parents, I've got to miss practice because we're trying for 17 hours this weekend, okay? For the other weekends that we do, what? They can come and go. It's okay. But the cool thing is, once I get groupness, Ah, there it is. They want to be there because their friends are there. Because they've experienced something that is remarkable in their lives, and they're like, no, I, I want to I be a part of this. 
this remarkable thing because they're yearning for it. Why do you think that vapid, ridiculous sitcom Friends was the number one sitcom among 15-year-olds every year that it ran? And now in syndication, it's still popular. It's not just because a bunch of young adults get to sleep around and live in two amazing places in Manhattan with no jobs. <laughs> okay? It's because young people are looking at these friends and they're like, oh, they have groupness. I want that. I yearn for that in my life. I don't have that. I yearn for it. It is so attractive. It is so compelling. I think the Lord made us this way. I really, truly do. So if I could frame it theologically, theological answer, why groupness? It is essential to faith formation. It is the very nature of God, and we are the imago dei, Latin for? God is relationship through the Trinity, so we are created for a relationship. If we believe that we are created in God's own image, okay, and God's image, God's very self is relationship to God's own three in one, okay, then being created in God's image means we are created for relationship. We have to be that. We yearn for it. We are desperate for it because we are created in God's own image and God, God's self, has groupness in God who is the mother and father of us all, God who is the son Jesus Christ, and God who is the Holy Spirit. It's a theological answer. It isn't just a cool thing to do. It isn't just fun. It doesn't just get allegiance or power. Andy Root, you had earlier talking to you about a new way of thinking about relating, etc. Okay? I'm arguing that the whole idea of this groupness is deeply theological because it is the nature of God, and we are created in God's image. Now, what I'm worried about is, to be honest with you, I think the 17 hours is going to go higher in the years to come. I really do. There's indication of that already among this generation. Please. I'm realizing now, thinking about my own history a million years ago, being in youth group. Yes. And in the century in which that was, um, there were fewer things to do. And so we achieved goodness early on. Precisely. I realized that. Precisely. You were. And so it wasn't just like, who are these people like that? Exactly. I'm just realizing now how the, the distractions yep. today and the other options yep. and the, you get a choice whether you go to church or not. Oh. I didn't have a choice. Thank you. Know, so it helps you, a lot. You named, it, you named it beautifully. You're exactly right. Please, I'm Emily. I'm going to piggyback off that is my most challenging moment is when parents either call me right yep. before you through, yep. well, who's there? Yep. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Being in that experiencing outside yeah. their comfort zone. And the parents are in their comfort zone. Exactly. Exactly. So if they don't go outside their comfort zone, the kids aren't going to go outside. Exactly. 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 What is, thank you. That, uh, you're testifying. You're exactly right. What's amazing to me is when, when the young people, again, have achieved this among themselves, okay, that sets that whole discourse aside. Because the question isn't being asked anymore who's going to show up, because they know groupness will happen. It's already happened, and they're going to be there with their friends, et cetera. I would say the body of Christ. And so it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them who's there and who's not there. What matters is that it's, it's taking place, and I want to be a part of it. Please. Sometimes I feel that that is the parents that we have to appeal to, because the parents, the parents nowadays think that these other things are important. Yes. You know, like, we need the scholarship money, so you have to play soccer. Yes, events, yes. Going to youth group exactly right. How, how, do we, um, how do we address that? Okay, so think, it's, tell me your name. Donna. Donna asked a brilliant question. Donna, you're exactly right. I, honestly, I've decided in my ministry to give up on it. Yeah. I can't convince my parents enough okay, that this is valuable. It's, it's not going to carry the same weight on their resume, on their kid's resume, when they apply to an Ivy League school. Okay, that starts with a Y, et cetera. <laughs> um, but what changes the whole conversation is when the kids themselves make the decision. Because suddenly, the parent's saying, oh, but honey, you need to go to soccer practice. And the kid says, actually, thanks, mom, but I need to be at youth group this weekend because we're doing this, this, and this, and this. Okay? I've discovered, and Donna, you're on it. Thank you for asking. When I tried to do the opposite way and get parents convinced first to make their kids come, okay, then, then I was lost. 
when the kid says, um, it's, called, it's called the fast food syndrome of church growth. That when um, people are looking for a church home and parents come in with a kid, an adolescent, and the parents are looking at this church and they're like, oh man, I don't know, this preacher, eh, the music, eh. It's sort of a hard place to get to. The parking's not great. Um, the theology could be not what we're looking for, etc. Their 12-year-old turns to them and says, this is a pretty good church. I think I want to come here. Guess what? They stay. Okay? It's called fast food syndrome of church growth because McDonald's, did you know this? McDonald's, um, Taco Bell, etc., Burger King. Oh, Wendy's, by the way, is number two in the world. Just overtook Burger King yesterday as fast food. Um, uh, Wendy's, etc., they lose money on their Happy Meal stuff. Did you know that? The reason why they do this, they know if they get the kid, they get, they get the car. They get the parents. Okay? It's called the fast food syndrome of church growth. All right? If I can get that kid to say, this is a pretty cool church, I'd like to come here, then the parents are like, okay. Cool, we'll come here. It's the same uh, phenomenon that I'm watching with young people. That if they say, this is worth my while and my time, even though the parents are saying, oh, but honey, you committed to this and this and this, they're like, mom, dad, this actually is more important to me. And then you begin to talk about language around that. And they say things like, because they're really, really good at this, this has to do with my eternal salvation. <laughs> No manipulation whatsoever. I know, I know. But no, thank you. I'm, seriously, thank you. It's a great question. I've, I've given up on trying to rationalize with parents because I'm not going to get there. Um, and I want to respect them as well. But when a kid says it, it changes the whole discourse. Please. Powerful. Wow. Oh, man. For three hours. And so it was really intense. She was calling her parents to come. To sure, her. sure, sure. And she was going to come until I said, no, you don't. Oh, golly. You know, because she needs to. No, it wasn't that she needs to suffer as much as the, you, that transfer yeah, of identity yeah, yeah. piece. And once she went through it, she, she settled in. But it, it, she wanted to just text. And, I yep. mean, the, the, the technology piece is isolating kids so much. It totally is. Yes. It was really, really intense. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but I, I think we've got to be mindful of this generation. It's, it, there's a big piece here. It, there is. Thank you for saying that. You're exactly right. Tell me your name. Lee. Lee says, um, and did you get this? Lee talks about, thank you. Lee talks about um, at a uh, mission trip, the first night, it was the first night, right? Um, a young woman went through almost a three hour period of like a panic attack, really. Um, and she was texting home and calling home and saying, please come get me, please come, I can't stay, please come get me. And you said to the parents, no, just wait. They were going to come. I know they were. Yeah. And because in the whoop, 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 day and age, okay, that's called what? Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Helicopter parents because they <laughs> hover. So they, they think, oh, she needs me again, so I'm going to rescue, okay, yeah. et cetera. What I need is, parent, is, is for you to say to the parents, her health is not in danger. Okay, we're right here. I've got 911 on speed dial. She'll be okay. What I need you to do is just give me some time. Just wait, okay? Because what the kid is experiencing is disorientation. On the other side of it, she gets to? And she realizes that she herself is stronger, resilient. Because at some point, she's going to go off to school or get married or end up on her own living somewhere. And she, if she tries to call them and parents come and rescue, then the pattern's already been set and it's dangerous. But as long as she's in a safe place and you can assure the parents she's okay, then I think you're exactly right. Okay? I need to move on because I'm watching time. I'm sorry. Um, I want to finish up with this. Um, if I look at the 21st century youth ministry, okay, this is a required reading for all of our first year students at Columbia Seminary, postmodern pilgrims. Len Sweet teaches at Drew Divinity School, really, really good guy. Lives in the San Juan Islands in Seattle. I don't get the commute thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> he written a, he's written a book called Postmodern Pilgrims, and I'm pulling a chapter from him. Sweet says, um, the 21st century church must be four things. 
And as a Presbyterian, I love this because it's an acronym. Um, experiential, <laughs> participatory, imagistic, that's actually my language, not his, um, and communal. As a scholar, you get to adapt people's ideas and then sort of think it's your own as an illusion. Um, <laughs> experiential, participatory, imagistic, communal. If I could line this out, what I want you to do is I want you to think about your youth ministry program, your ministry with young people, whatever it is, as experiential, as participatory, as imagistic, and communal, okay? I think Sweet's onto it. I think he gets it. I think the nature of the church in the 21st century has to be thinking about these four things. So, um, if you've been to, uh, it's going to come. If you've been to um, Disneyland or Disney World, um, you've seen this. Hopefully, it's called. It's a signature ride in California Adventure. It's called um, Soaring Over California. Have you been? To, who's been? To, who's, who's seen this? Anybody? Have you? Good. Okay. This. Um, Sweet says this, um, well, this is my interpretation. He doesn't say this. I think this is the essence of experience, okay? So what, what Disney does is they put you in these, these things, they lift you up off the floor, and it's like you're hang gliding over California, okay? And so you see all these images of California, all right? So there's wonderful music. Audition, I'll play it for you so you can hear it. Um, so you're going over, you know, Northern California, the rivers, etc. You end up moving from there. You go into um, these beautiful, beautiful parts of North Carolina with hot air balloons. You're soaring, etc. As you, as you, as the vehicle tips you down, the wind speed in the theater increases. So it blows your hair, okay? And you move this way and that way, etc. When you go over Big Sur, what happens in the theater? They squirt water in, so, that, so, you, so you feel water, okay? And you smell, they, they insert the smell of salt into the theater, okay? Then you go over the Sierra Nevadas and you're skiing, the temperature in the theater drops, okay? And you go over this, I mean, this is all experiential. Um, in a moment, you'll go over orange groves in the Imperial Valley of California. When you go over the orange groves, what? They insert the smell of oranges in the theater, okay? So, um, I've quantified, I've pushed, and Lynn and I have talked about this. I think experiential um, means you engage more than one sense at a time. I think that's the essence of experience. I think our young people are, ex are yearning for an experience of Jesus. And the way you get that is by engaging more than one sense at a time. What's the problem with most of our worship? Boring. Okay, it's boring. <laughs> it is boring because we only engage? One. Typically, what sense? Hearing. Hearing, okay? And in the neuroscience right now, in the brain research, which is just rocking my world, in the neuroscience, in terms of brain activity, of the senses, the one that engages the least amount of brain power? Hearing, audition. The one that engages the most brain power, this is in functional magnetic resonance imaging that we can do for the first time only seven years ago. Visual. No. Visual. Visual. It's seeing. Smell, thank you. Olfactory is the strongest remembering sense because it's the only one that doesn't have to go through the amygdala, which is the gatekeeper for memory. Okay? That's why smell is so important. But in terms of actual brain engagement, seeing is the most. All right? So, Think about ministry with young people as experiential, ways you engage more than one sense at a time, simultaneously. And young people seem to walk out saying, I get Jesus, because you've engaged more than one sense. So one of my um, uh, students, and you know this is a call from the Holy Spirit, because she used to be an Imagineer in Pasadena, uh, in Anaheim, and she left that to come to seminary. I'm like, you messed up in a big way. Um, <laughs> You had the best job in the whole wide world and you come to seminary, stupid girl. Anyway, um, um, she said, she actually worked, I talked about this in class, and she actually worked on soaring over California, development of it. And she, and she pulled me aside afterwards and said, Professor, you know, um, I worked on soaring. I said, did you? And she goes, yeah, it was great. And I said, well, I'm intrigued. Tell me about it. And she goes, well, we, you know, we got sound because you hear music, et cetera. We got touch because you feel the wind and you feel the spray. We got smell because the oranges and the salt, et cetera. Um, and we got this idea of seeing because you see everything. Okay? And of course, it ends at Disneyland. 
uh, the happiest place on earth, okay? Um, I said, but you're missing the last one. And she said, I know. We worked on that for a year and a half. I said, taste, really? And she goes, oh, yeah, we worked on it for a year and a half. And we couldn't get it because she said we, would, we tried giving people a candy when they would walk in, or some, something to put in their mouths for taste. And, I, and she says it was a complete straight face. And I said, what happened? And she goes, we discovered people have totally different suck factors. <laughs> and I said, it took you a year and a half to find out that people have different suck factors? I could have told you that today, OK? And she's, she's, not, she's not good. She's like, OK, okay fine. I'm like, you need to get a sense of humor. Anyway, um, but she said, Disney which is doing some of the best attention span research in the country, they're trying to figure out what they have to do to keep people's attention on a ride, okay? <laughs> and where, and what they're saying experiential is engaging more than one sense at a time. Participatory. You and I live in a participatory age. Um, uh, our young people expect to be able to participate. They don't expect to be spectators. They expect to be able to participate. So this is Tahrir Square. This started, remember, with whom? Teenagers. Youth. College students and high school students, secondary students. All their lives, all they knew was martial law under US-supported President Mubarak. Okay? over 42 years of martial law, their whole lives. The first night, apparently, the word is about 63 high school secondary students and college students gathered in the Tahrir Square in the heart of Cairo, most populous Arab nation in the world. And to Mubarak's credit or disillusionment, they didn't push them out. They were there for four days. On the fifth day, there were over 700 of them there. Remember what happened on the sixth day, do you call? Thugs came in that we found out later were hired by the government and dressed down. And they came in on camels and cars, and, they, and three people died that night. Okay? The next day, do you remember what happened? Who came for the first time to the square? Grandparents, actually. It was older adults. And there was an interview that I have that I love of an older adult man speaking in Arabic, a grandparent. And they asked him, this, is, this was on Al Jazeera in English, they asked him, why did you come? And the translation says, he says, because they were beating my grandchildren. He said, at first I thought, oh, these are just kids. The government will soon dispense with them. But then I saw that they were beating my grandchildren. I'm an old man. They can kill me, but they cannot kill my grandchildren. The next day, then who came? Parents came. Grandparents, parents, children were in the square. 23 days, 23 days, the regime ended. 23 days. This is a participatory time. Social networking allows that to happen. This is a participatory time. Third issue, imagistic. The expectation is that there would be the opportunity to see things, engage as much of the part of the brain as possible. Sweet says, it's a marvelous quote, Sweet says, the shift is from a culture of the page to a culture of the screen. Sweet also says, the problem is, any institution that has achieved the highest expression of a given medium has the most difficult time changing when the next medium comes along. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We love the page. I teach at a graduate school in theology. I love the page. I got a PhD based upon the page. Okay? And now we're being told to shift to the screen. It's a huge, huge shift, and we are resistant. The church of Jesus Christ perhaps most of all, Gutenberg Bibles. I mean, come on, we are the people of the page. We get this. We are in an imagistic age. Last one, um, we are in a communal age. Knowing is constructed. 
So um, I believe we are in a constructivist society now where we're knowing Jesus, knowing God, knowing the church, knowing the Holy Spirit, knowing God's activity in the world, it is not up to any one person. Knowing now is constructed. Um, Wikipedia, which by the way is not an adequate citation for a scholarly paper. <laughs> My students are like, I got it from Wikipedia, I gave you a citation, like that is not a citation. Dean, is that correct? It's not a citation. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm gonna tell them the Although Dean. Oh. <laughs> I like this Dean. Dean Britton, thank you very much. You just ruined my whole prison. The, the, that's, uh, that's, uh, checks on it. I want, give me the source at the bottom. Don't give me the web page site. Okay? But, but I think we are in a wiki world. I think we do wiki theology. I think we understand this. Um, our young people, they're not buying. Two years ago, for the first time, we had more online downloads for music than CDs. Because they're not going to listen to somebody else's idea of an album. They're going to? They're going to make their own. They're going to create their own. Knowledge is being constructed in this day and age. If you think there's resonance, I love this about the Lord. If you think there's resonance to the, to the church, liberation theology church, remember in the base communities, when these Roman Catholic priests begin to think, golly, even these quote unquote uneducated peasants, these farmers, if I just read the scripture to them and turn to them and say, what do you think this means? And they begin to say in their own words, in their own context, I think this is what the Lord's saying to us through this text. That began this whole movement of socially constructed understandings of how God is speaking to us through scripture in these days. And initially, the Roman church was threatened by that, which is typical of any power structure. These people don't even have degrees. How can they speak with integrity about the scriptures? And yet, these liberation theology, these base communities, it has set us on fire throughout the entire world. Young people are in the same mode. They know things that you and I do not know. They understand God in ways that I do not understand God. So in all humility and with the grace of God and by the mercies of God, I depend upon them to help me know what it is God is calling me and us to do in these days. It's this posture that I think we're being called to. It's an epic posture, experiential, participatory, imagistic and communal, okay? I've given you, I've thrown stuff at you, um, uh, and I'm mindful that this isn't as imagistic as I would like it to be, nor is it as communal or as participatory as I'd like it to be, um, but I'm grateful to you for the precious gift of your time. Yeah, okay. Thank you all.